Eric, thank you so much for giving me the privilege to ask you a few questions today about medicinal mushrooms. Anytime. H happy to be here and thanks, thanks for the invite. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your background and what made you made you become so knowledgeable and expert in medicinal mushrooms because you don't you you're not only like uh, you didn't only base the company Kappa Health, but you also I've I've chatted with you several times and you know so much about the nitty gritty details of the biology of the mushrooms and the neurobiology behind how they affect and the immune system got and how did you gain all this knowledge? What made you so interested? Yeah, my background. So I'm, um, uh, I studied business actually in the business school in the US, uh, the Kelly School University there. And I was also doing corporate consulting then after business school in Chicago um, with a company called KPMG. So I was uh, helping very large companies make more money. And it was very interesting. I was very yeah, early 20s. It was flying around the world, you know. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of nice, but it wasn't feeding my soul. I, I wasn't getting any, any real satisfaction from that, from that work. So I, I kind of went on this journey, maybe about eight years, 10 years, something like that, of really finding what, what I wanted to see more in the world, um, what I wanted to, what, what my ethics were, what, what else was out there other than just the state of Indiana, uh, where I grew up. And, um, you know, just, just what the whole world looked like and, and, and new experiences. And I, I started a few companies, started a few nonprofits, had a few small jobs, hitchhiked around Europe for a few years. I did a lot of lecturing, a lot of talking. Uh, I met a lot of people. And uh, I came to realize that actually what I really love is biotech. I love biotech. And biotech to me, I, so I'm an entrepreneur in my, in my soul. Like if I, like I love solving problems, I see the opportunity in everything. Um, no matter what it looks like, I can, I can see past whatever. I, I, I'm always looking five years ahead, always. And um, so I love solving problems massively. I, I really, really enjoy that. Uh, almost addicted to it somehow. Um, and and, and as, a, as, a, as a methodology to solve problems, biotech to me is the most interesting. So I would so much rather look to nature for the answers for problems than look to our, our own minds or our own laboratories or something that, that we develop. Uh, and that's that's sort of the, to me what biotech really at its fundamental level is um, is looking to nature for those answers. So I'm not a technical person. Um, so I I don't have a microbiology background. I don't have a, a science background at all. Um, business administration is, is basically my my background. Um, but I uh, when I when I moved to Finland. Uh, about five and a half years ago, I started really networking with people here, started going to different sort of uh, uh, accelerator groups or networking groups, uh, learning who's doing what and in the biotech field and what is kind of going on there. And um, I found uh, one of my co-founders at one of these micro meetups in Helsinki and just basically kept uh, talking to me about all the potential that mushrooms can do, all the, all the problems that mushrooms can solve. And of course, I'm just loving that, you know, that they can do this and they can do that and they can do this. And medicinal mushrooms, there's not a whole lot of good companies in the market and, and people are talking about it very strange and there's a lot of misinformation and, you know, look what's happening in the US market. And, you know, I started to do a market analysis and realized there's not a lot of companies that I really like in that space and that there, there could be space for one more, you know. Uh, and that that would be a good life mission to to really pursue um, and really see what fungi can really bring us in terms of ecosystem health and human health. Uh, and so that's that's how we started the company. And that's kind of my background. So so now that I was kind of committed on this path of fungi uh, and especially medicinal fungi, uh, now I've been really getting involved in everywhere that I can. So I stick my nose in every scientific paper that comes out almost. I'm on the uh, I was I was awarded very, yeah, thankfully to the executive committee of the International Medicinal Mushroom Society. Uh, and that's a, that's a great honor to be part of that as that's, that's where all the researchers that are doing research in medicinal mushroom space are publishing their papers, are doing presentations at the Congress. So I'm getting, we're getting really good access as a company to those, to that research that comes out. Um, and just for your listeners and for you also, Inka, um, the International Medicinal Mushroom Congress 11 is going to be happening this year in Serbia, uh, in the EU. So it'll be very, yeah. So if you're interested, it's, it's the, to meet some other mushroom nerds, um, it's a great place to go. I mean, it's, it's just the most up-to-date latest scientific research about medicinal compounds and, and how, how, how they're interacting in the body um, in different plenary sessions. So basically the researchers are just presenting, you know, papers that they've done 
Um, it's really heady, but then there's also really great dinners and stuff too. So it's a, it's a nice social networking event as well. Um, but it's a lot of fun. We're going to be going there with a lot of people from the company. But we also, the last thing I want to say is that we also have a, a lead research analyst in the company. His name's Peter Petros. And, uh, and, and he's actually probably one of the most knowledgeable people in the world about medicinal mushroom compounds, to be honest, at this point. So where, where I don't have a technical background, he really does. Um, he comes from that, that research space. So he's able to read those papers, digest them. Um, and, and for, you know, stupid person like me, uh, help me, help me really understand what they're doing. And then we can then implement that into how we, how we grow the mushrooms or how we, uh, process those mushrooms or, or how we package them or just how that, how that works internally. That's awesome. That's like, um, it sounds like that you have a like very good synergy and a very good team there to actually bring out the, um, the best in the products, best in medicinal fungi. And we're going to talk about a little bit about the, the quality or what makes a quality product and what makes basically your product uh, like very good uh, bioavailable source of these uh, compounds uh, of, of benefit in medicinal fungi and everything. But first of uh, all, maybe can you give us a little bit of explanation of what is actually medicinal fungi? How, how is that different from uh, just a normal mushroom that we see in the nature and go pick up and eat put to our salads mm. uh, or culinary fungi? How, what is it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, because I think we, we, we really like to put things in boxes. <laughs> so, so we want to, we want to really have a clear separation between culinary fungi, the wild fungi, medicinal fungi. Um, whereas it's nature's not like that. Um, Nature doesn't compartmentalize so much. Um, this reductionism is, is really not not exactly the case many times. So, for instance, yeah, nature shiitake... doesn't go like, "Oh, I'll just no. <laughs> do a culinary fungi now." <laughs> yeah, ex- no, I'll be culinary fungi. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, I, I think it's it's more messy, you know. And and just a quick tangent about that. I mean, I think it's everything that we're learning, especially in the mycorrhizal fungi science, or you know, it's it's really messy. They change they change like a biology. They change um, living strategy. It, it's really fantastic. Uh, and, and I think biotech and as a space in general, we, the, the companies and the researchers who will succeed in that are ones that want to look at a more holistic approach. What, how does that whole ecosystem interact with each other? That's going to be a really big, really big thing in the next coming decade. Um, but back, back to the culinary and medicinal side. So <clears throat> for instance, there's a mushroom called shiitake that we're probably all familiar with. So shiitake is, is a culinary mushroom. You know, you can eat it at restaurants, you can buy it in the grocery store, yeah, but it's also a medicinal mushroom. So, so does, does cooking it basically, um, you know, does eating it uh, culinarily, does that give you medicinal benefits? And the, the answer is kind of uh, a little bit. So I think that, you know, basically, you know, mushrooms are more related to human beings and plants, right? So we have a lot more DNA similar with mushrooms. We have a much more similar immune system with mushrooms than we do with plants, but mo- like a really a majority of a lot of the herbal supplements that we have or food supplements are from plant derived sources. Uh, and I think that there's just more of a history around that. It's easier actually to get those medicinal compounds from plants. They're more bioavailable. With mushrooms, they're very complex. You know, frying some shiitake in a pan and eating that maybe those beta-glucan compounds or L-ergothyrene compounds in there, maybe they're only 5% bioavailable. So they go, basically they just go right through your body. So you're not getting that medicinal benefit. So it's a medicinal mushroom without a medicinal benefit, basically, if you, if you eat it culinarily. So what, what, what really, when we're talking about our company with medicinal mushrooms, we're talking about, you know, mushrooms that have medicinal compounds um, that we, we of course standardize, we look, we research those things and, that our company then goes into extracting that and making sure that those compounds then are bioavailable. Uh, and and many, that's what many companies are doing when they're looking at medicinal mushrooms. Mm, that's a very great explanation and very clear as well. So what are the, some of the compounds in these medicinal mushrooms that are linked to the health benefits? Yeah. Um, there's a, well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but Maybe I, I some, think that some key main ones, the, the main, the main ones. Yeah. So I think the, the most well-known and researched and studied compound in, in mushrooms, in especially medicinal mushrooms is beta glucans and, and beta glucans are a compound that helps create kind of the cell wall structure of the mushroom itself. So 
they're very, they're very prevalent, probably in almost every mushroom that you find to some degree, right? So when we talk about medicinal mushrooms, like, like maitake, I think has the, the highest amount that we've been able to standardize of beta-glucans. Some are just really high in beta-glucans, but beta, beta-glucans um, are, there's, lot, there's beta-glucans also in yeast. Um, there's also beta-glucans in oats, um, but the beta-glucans from fungi specifically have a specific branching pattern called 1316. Uh, and if you look it up, you can see exactly how those ends branch off. So it's so not all beta glucans are the same, I guess, is the important thing to understand. And the specificness about this 1316 branching structure from fungi um, really allows it to have more connection points to your gut and then to your immune system. So we know that these beta glucans can bypass through the large intestinal wall, which is really fun to think about. It's kind of like you know, your body's really like, okay, yes, come on in here. You got something to give me. Um, not just go right through. And, and when it's then inside of our bodies, in, inside, not in this like digestive tract, um, when it's inside then into our body, it's really interacting with the immune system quite a lot. And so this is, this is, the, this is the compounded mushrooms that's been studied for you know, 35, 40 plus years in the Western world, um, maybe thousands of years you know, in, in, in the East. Um, but, but these compounds are really immunomodulatory for our immune system. So that's like a really overused word in a way, adaptogenic, overused word. Um, but what they're doing is they're sort of regulating and moderate, modulating our immune system. So if it's overactive, it's helping it calm down. So if you have autoimmune problems, you know, your body's attacking itself too much, it can help calm that down and it can also do the opposite. So that's what we're seeing a lot from the literature review, indications of these things. And this is pretty well documented science now with over, you know, a thousand uh, papers around this point in, in, in vivo, in, in vitro, this kind of idea. Um, it's, it's interacting with killer T cells, macrophages. I mean, pretty much everything that we know, and they've even found beta glucans from fungi, uh, in the tips of our fingers. So once they get into our body, they're really seeking out places of like long-term inflammation. They're helping to combat that. Um, so, you know, it's, it, they're really, it's an incredible, let's say, um, daily regime, you know? And I, and I think when, when our bodies are now, many of us live in cities, uh, we are in very clean environments. We're, we're using a lot of cleaning products. This has a really effect on our immune system. So, so for instance, in, um, in Japan, if you're working in a laboratory environment where the air has been filtered to like, you know, 99.9%, basically just atmosphere, there's very little particulate in these laboratory clean rooms. Also in our lab, we have these HEPA filters that are, you know, laminar flow hoods that are really blowing clean, clean, really clean air at you. Um, that can actually, within three or four hours of being in, in that environment, can start to actually considerably see a diminish of your immune system. So in Japan, they have actually government regulated requirements. You cannot be there for that for too long. Because what happens if we're in a too clean space, if we have bleached everything, if we're not getting, you know, um, you know, and not eating a little bit of dirt every day, you know, all this kind of stuff, what happens? Our immune system basically goes, well, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> You know, I don't need, I don't need, why, why give resources to a, to a, to a, like an organ or, or a specialist part of our body that's, that's not really needed. Um, so one way to kind of check that is, is with, the, with adaptogenic mushrooms and, and, and beta glucans, it really keeps everything kind of working how it should. So for me, it's, it's part of my daily reg regimen. And I think many, many people as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's an actually very important point that you said that, um, because we're emphasizing so much these, these days about the air quality and the the harmful effects of I don't know toxins in the environment or or, or pollution or whatever, but like uh, nature, like mm, yeah, like we need a little bit of hormetic stressors, and we also need to to immerse into the natural environments, like uh, have that natural dirt to support our own immune system. So somehow then mushrooms can perhaps provide us this, if I understood correctly, provide us this like um, environment or, or, or the immunity benefits that nature would also provide us. Did I understand yeah. it right? Mm. Yeah. And I think probably, you know, obviously, you know, we, we were at the biohacking retreat together with Seam mm -hmm. Lab uh, in, in Estonia there. And Seam, of course, is like really into this right now. This, it, this mm. is like his, his main focus is this, we have to have stress. We have to stress our bodies. We have to keep things active. We have to, that's how we build up. That's how we maintain, you know, consistency. So, 
I, I, I think that it's, um, it's becoming more popular. People are realizing that more. I think if, you know, if you look back when I was a kid, oh God, I don't know, I don't, 20 something years ago, 25 years ago, I remember going to my aunt's house and she would put these big gloves on, right? And she would do her dishes and like some seriously toxic, uh, you know, chemicals. And she would always have like a, I, we kind of made a joke that she had a belt, you know, with a bleach bottle on it, you know, and it's like, oh, something spilled. She can, she could clean that up. Um, and, and I think that that was really what we thought what we should do. You know, the mo- we're going to help improve our health through chemicals. We're going to help improve our health through making our environments really clean. And that's not the case at all. And, and, and now more and more, we're starting to realize that. I think, Inka, have you seen that, that study by um, Professor Aki out of University of Helsinki, where he took dirt from the forest and put it into the, the Paivakoti, the daycare systems mm-hmm. here in Finland? Have you seen that? No, no, I haven't. Okay, yeah, this tell, is this tell, is like tell us about it. So, yeah. yeah, so this is maybe one of my favorite studies that's come out like in the last year or two. Um, but I'll send you a link. But basically, what he did is he put so he was he was hypothesizing that that the gut microbiome, of course, helps modulate our, our immune system, helps modulate our health, and that being able to get a, a wider the biodiversity of, of of microbiome from uh, the forest just is going to be good for these you know city kids, city you know ch- children who are in these city by Pivaco, these, these daycare systems. So all he did was he went to the forest from Finland. He brought forest soil into that space and let them just play with it. You know, so of course they lick their hands. They get that, you know, comes through their skin, that whole thing. <clears throat> and they had a uh, reduction of their sickness levels. They had, they had an increase of their health from that. Just that, you know, that's it. And so now, you know, governments around the world are calling him and, and, and Finland to how do we implement this? How do we get more dirt in our Pivaco? And that is such a amazingly different way to think about how we can help human health actually it's like what we were talking about at the start of the podcast it's more complex things are more complex we have such sure. weird interactions we have such complex systems like we grew up we evolved to be living in dirt we evolved to have that relationship with that gut microbiome we evolved to have that dirt in us we evolved to have that stress factors and now we're trying you know trying to get that back in in some way so yeah definitely medicinal mushrooms is, is a path for that definitely oh, great Thanks for sharing the the study as well. And uh, now, if if you haven't yet gone out and brought a dirt to your to your room, and any listener, go and do that. <laughs> Bring some dirt yeah. to your room and play with it. There was a, uh, a startup <laughs> company that actually, yeah, there was a startup company that started after that 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 post was made, and they they now make a kids play doh. You know, like kids can make little shapes and hearts and stuff, and it's play doh that actually has the the forest Finnish forest microbiome in it. So, <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> <laughs> I found That's that so great. funny. Oh, yeah, yeah, and actually, I really like that you talk about the the immunity benefits and the and the gut benefits. And one of the main interests of mine, of course, the connection between gut and the brain, and how that modulates some brain benefits. Uh, so, especially like um, reishi mushroom, um, that there was a I read some studies that uh, it improved some of the brain brain factors for for example sleep and stuff like that um or some things that would usually be related to only brain factors uh, via modulating the gut and improving the gut uh, for example serotonin production and all of those like also peripheral neurotransmitters so that was very cool and um actually wanted to discuss a little bit about the brain benefits of the mushroom because many times we talk about mushrooms for immunity mushrooms for gut uh, but there are also like uh, great brain benefits, uh, cognitive benefits, mental health benefits. Mm. Uh, one of my favorite mushrooms for sure that I've I've been using for years, maybe like uh, since 2016 or something, uh, is lion's mane. And I found that especially effective when I was, I, I was at uni, I was studying. So uh, yeah, I first got interested in it because... Uh, it can improve like nerve growth factors and support memory and i started using it and i i don't know i just it intuitively feels very good to use it so uh can you talk talk about a little bit about uh for example the lion's mane and the research in that one well yeah wow 2016 you were using lion's mane so you are like you're like the definition of an early adapter. But yeah, I think Lion's Mane is get, it's probably our number one seller, no question, <laughs> um, because I think that it's it, it has such promising research. It has such promising indications in research. 
uh, that are <clears throat> very exciting for us as a company, and I think very exciting for for, for biohackers and, and pretty much any anybody on the planet, to be honest. We we talked about beta glucans, which is pretty much across all mushrooms. But like you mentioned, reishi, lion's mane, every mushroom also has what we call secondary metabolites, uh, and these can be like in reishi, ganodermic acid, triterpene compounds. You know, in in lion's mane specifically, we actually know the actives that are helping with the brain. Um, so there's a there's a really nice um, uh, research institution out of, um, uh, Germany that we're working with on that. And there's also the, uh, professor in Japan, who's been able to identify what, what these compounds are. So there's a lot of uh, research right now being done on understanding this better. Um, and I think, you know, companies are, are, are able now to have a bit more understanding of what is actually happening there. So this is a really interesting and, and kind of a new space, this lion's main space. Um, but effectively, what we've understood is that there's two main groups of compounds. One's called arinacines and one called heresanones. And we also know that these are, these are technically groups of compounds because there's arinacines A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. <clears throat> and, and we know that some of these compounds of arinacines can be mildly toxic. Some of them can be really helpful. So there's so much still research being done about this, you know. Um, but, you know, these, these compounds... What we do know pretty certainly is that they are able to cross the blood brain barrier, which as you know, is a very exciting thing as that, that doesn't happen very often. And what we've been trying to, what we've been trying, scientists have been trying to increase in terms of like, you know, brain health is increased NGF or nerve growth factor. Um, and the problem with nerve growth factor is like, you know, Inca, Inca, you or I can't just like, we can't take a supplement of NGF. Um, well, you can, you can take a supplement, but it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't then it, NGF doesn't bypass the blood brain barrier. So, you know, there are companies selling NGF supplements, but there's no evidence that it crosses the blood brain barrier at all. So how do you stimulate NGF um, in, in the brain? And we know that over time, our brains start to produce less and less NGF. Okay. So we have this, we have this longevity issue. We have this aging issue. We have a, we know that it is NGF. How do we stimulate that? Right. We can't take directly an NGF um, supplement. Maybe you could do like an NGF <laughs> injection in your brain. Maybe Inca, you know more about that than me. Um, but basically it's very difficult to, to get, yeah, NGF in your brain. Um, so what, what Lion's Mane specifically is doing is these two compounds, arinacins and heresanones, are crossing the blood-brain barrier and activating NGF, st stimulating NGF production. Uh, and in some clinicals, up to eight times increase. So this is quite, quite, quite significant amount. Um, <clears throat> and why does that matter? That, that's a great question. Why, why do we care about NGF? So NGF is doing very important things um, like stimulating neurogenesis, helping increase plasticity of the mind, decreasing amyloid beta plaque buildup, which, I mean, amyloid beta plaque buildup is effectively at some level of amyl amyloid beta plaque buildup, you are diagnosed with dementia. It's like cancer. We all have cancer growing inside of us, right? but it's under control of our immune system. At some point, the cancer is out of control and then we actually have cancer, right? Um, and it's the same with dementia. At, at some point, the amyloid beta plaque buildup is so much that we have dementia, but any amount of amyloid beta plaque buildup is hurting our ability to remember things or, or learn new, new things, or it's effectively why, you know, I haven't learned Finnish in five and a half years uh, and my six-year-old daughter figured it out in like a year and a half, you know? Um, it's it's just a, that that's exactly what's happening. Is that as we age, our brains, our, the brain health, it just starts to diminish. You know, so being able to find a way to stimulate NGF is a really important protocol for 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 brain health and for aging, aging protocol. And we know that lion's mane is a, a significant uh, contributor for that, as indicated by the clinical studies. Yeah, uh, that's a very good, uh, very good explanation and. Uh... Yeah, yeah, especially for me, at least, uh, it's also very interesting, like, how can we actually use this possibly in the future for for combating lifestyle-mediated diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, which the burden is just increasing in this world. And we know that, that this uh, amyloid bed buildup is, like, the main, and tau phosphorylation are, are like, the main factors that contribute yeah. to the development of the disease. And actually, I... I noticed the study as well it was like um 
uh, I think it was a review study on the mechanisms of lion's mane and also it, it decreased uh, not only the amyloid beta buildup so by actually increasing the, the clearance of it uh, or the breakdown but also it um, decreased the um, or reduced the tau hyperphosphorylation. So tau can be like form these tangles that then start forming plaques that start uh, slowly making the brain cells die. Um, and especially like this lion's mane, it was um, like so hippocampus is very critical brain area for memory, for learning, for um, for just uh, basically everything mood as well because it's very rich in serotonergic energic, uh, neurons and receptors uh, so this lion's mane increased ngf particularly in the hippocampus uh, so it's like uh, yeah super interesting interesting of course the, the research is is still uh, like young or like the specific mechanisms but there there is so much data already and we know that, that like, at least like there is a great potential and this stuff should be researched more. And actually talking about research, can you uh, tell a little bit about the research that you do as well in Kappa? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I guess just one, one, one quick thing is uh, are many of your mm. listeners from Europe or from the US, do you know? But Probably both. Mostly Europe, both. Okay, well, mm. I think what's, what's really interesting to know is that in Europe, we have a little bit of a problem when it comes to lion's mane, basically. So what we know with this aranacines and heresanone compounds is that aranacines are in the mycelium, the pure mycelium of the fungi lion's mane, and heresanones are in the fruiting body, right? And so what we want to have is basically a, a, a product that's containing both of those. I mean, independently, they're both also, you know, but crossing the blood-brain barrier, activating, you know, NGF stimulation. So a fruiting body product is, is, is really still good there, um, but you'd really want to have a mix of both. And unfortunately, this mycelium, lion's mane mycelium is not uh, approved novel food in Europe, meaning it, it's not able to be sold. So, you know, I think that there's just across, you know, everything, like you said, there's more research that needed to be done, absolutely. But there's also this regulatory hurdles that need to be really addressed as well. And, and we really need to like, yeah, our company really just needs to take the leadership here and get some of this stuff figured out, to be honest, is what, what I think. Mm -hmm. Because it's, uh, it's really a shame that um, there would be a hurdle to this kind of medicine getting to people that, that need it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but okay. what was your question again? Uh, so, uh, uh, maybe talk a little bit about, because you'd also do research. Oh, the research. Gaffa. Sure. Yeah, so we have, uh, we have a quite large like uh, mycological laboratory in, in Kappa. Uh, where we do original research on uh, basically kind of how best to grow these mushrooms, right? So a lot of our focus has been on uh, chaga mushroom and uh, reishi mushroom specifically, um, because there's a lot to be gained with how those are grown. So how we grow chaga um, has actually what, what was what caused me to be nominated for this executive committee for the International Medicinal Mushroom Society, because basically until now, the main source, well, it's still now, but basically the main source of chaga is wild forage chaga. Uh, a lot of it comes from Russia and Siberia. A lot of it comes from Lapland and Finland. Um, so a little bit comes from Alaska. And basically when you're, when you're collecting something from the nature, um, you know, the compound levels could be really good in one batch, not so good in another batch. You know, it's, it's very variable, right? It's, it's not so controlled, let's say. So it's very difficult to make, um, you know, nutraceutical grade food supplements, or uh, products like that from that as a source. So, you know, when we started the company, we looked at that and said, okay, there's two main problems here. One, the, the strain that is being used is unreliable, right? It's totally, it's totally wild. It's genetics are changing all the time. So just like you and me are both uh, human beings, you look way different than I do, you know, thankfully. <laughs> um, so, you know, the geno the, the, the phenotype uh, of the DNA can express itself in many different ways. So, you know, sometimes, like when we buy apples, sometimes they're really sweet and nice, sometimes they're sour. And we want to reliably have that characteristics when we buy an apple. We don't want to have a surprise when we go to the grocery store that tastes just horrible. No, no sugar. It's not nice. So same thing for chaga, you know. So what we did is we looked at some, um, we, we decided on uh, a strain, a production strain of chaga, which we feel really good about. And we're actually putting that into living birch trees around Finland. And we are currently uh, 
you know, managing the world's largest chaga cultivation network. So well, this is a really, yeah, this is a really exciting thing for us because it's kind of taken chaga to that next level. You know, every other medicinal mushroom, almost every, every other nutraceutical, you know, we're controlling a little bit how it grows, if it's not so much. And chaga is very interesting. You don't want to control it fully. You really want it to be there outdoors. It needs to have, uh, it needs to be living on a, on a birch, a living birch tree host because chaga is not technically a mushroom. It's, it's actually a, a, a canker, a sterile conch that is a reaction. It's part tree. It's 90% tree. Actually, it's more, it's more birch tree than it is a chaga fungus actually. Um, but it's sort of an interaction between that birch tree and that fungus. It's a very interesting thing. And uh, it, it's actually taking a lot of the interesting uh, compounds from a birch tree. It's making those bio, uh, different forms that are bioavailable for us. So it's actually some of the, it's the highest in antioxidant compounds gram for gram of anything that we've found on the planet, anything that's been tested ever. And so that's, it's a very interesting, you know, mushroom. And there's a lot of research and time that we've spent into how best to grow that mushroom. So the other problem that, that Chaga has is that it's being over harvested currently. So Finland is the only country in the world that is actively regulating and managing and ins ensuring uh, that Chaga is not over harvested. So they don't have those standards in Estonia. They're not having those standards in Russia, Canada, Alaska, and the U.S. And what's happening in those places, I know more about Canada and the U.S., um, but they're, you know, it's, it's kind of disappearing. It's not commercially harvested really in, in, in North America anymore, except in higher areas of Canada and then remote parts of Alaska, because it's been pushed so far deep into the woods. Um, and so Chaga, obviously the, it's one of our top sellers. The growth is only increasing massively each year. Uh, medicinal mushrooms are growing massively each year. They're, they're the, the second fastest growing nutraceutical category for the North American market. They're the fourth largest category by sales volume. So here we are, we got to come up with more chaga. So our company's also approach was, hey, let's do, let's do, let's also cultivate it in a very sustainable and renewable and regenerative way. Because I mean, the nature needs these fungi yeah, to function, they use them. Yeah. So um, yeah, you, you sort of like, uh, like solve the problem of maybe chaga is becoming like an endangered species or something like that. And you sort of take your responsibility and hey, if we are going to take it away from the nature we also are going to produce it yeah definitely That's, definitely yeah i had the privilege of of visiting your your chaga cultivation plantation and <laughs> it was yeah. crazy i remember i remember we went to the tree and you were like oh yeah we have like injected the chaga how do you call it the, like the little plugs yeah <laughs> yeah the blocks there to the tree and i'm like oh great when can we get the mushroom they're like oh in 12 years 14 yeah, years like, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah it's like a very good wine it takes a lot of patience but we're, we're, what we're seeing right now is that chagas are coming out about three like we have small chagas that have developed after about three years um within within one or two years you can already start to see the first formations of a chaga but really the actual you know chagas are coming out about three years but it takes a long time to grow but I think yeah, it's, uh, and it's, I don't think many people actually realize it when they take their daily chaga, for example, that it, it was like it grew 12 years before it got. Yeah, into the I mean, to be honest, most of the chaga that we use in our production are, are even 20 years plus. You know, I mean, it's just wow. it, it's funny, you know, people ask how long mushrooms take to grow. And it's like, well, six weeks to 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how long it takes so i mean it's it's really difficult to to it's so complex everything each, each yeah. species is entirely a different a different idea but a lot of our research is really focused on as a so we have we have kappa health division where we're selling um you know our own product line for for people to buy we have a website all that kind of stuff and then we also have an ingredient division where we're helping other brands um sourcing their medicinal mushroom uh products so that they're getting ingredients from us. So for us, it's, you know, we want to specialize really just in production and in, in how to grow it, how to grow it and how, how best to make it that the highest level of compounds of interest are in the raw material and then how to extract it and, and produce it in a way that it's most bioavailable. That's what our company's focusing. That's our bread and butter. So that, that's a lot where our research goes into. So, you know, another part of our, so that's on the product, the, the growing side. On the production side, you know, we were um, the first to bring ultrasonic assisted extraction to the ingredient space um, for medicinal mushrooms. So, so we know that in, in ancient Chinese literature, 
you know, yeah. traditional Chinese medicine, they're using alcohol as a chemical solvent, basically, to, to dissolve the, the cell wall to make it more bioavailable, um, which is great. We also use that in our soma line of, uh, of tinctures. And we, um, we also use ultrasonic assisted extraction. So that's also basically creating this kind of cavitation process of it's making a lot of micro explosions actually in the liquid, which is then also opening up those cells a bit more. So in combination with these different extraction methods, we can ensure like, the highest bioavailability, you know, in the market. And that, that, that's what's important for us. Yeah. But that, I mean, yeah. that project itself, it seems like a simple thing. I just talked about it. It took maybe a minute for me to explain that, but that was six months of R&D time of just of just doing literature review understanding the best way to do the extraction for all these species um that was six months of r d time then it was time to buy the, you know find the machinery we had to custom make everything so it's it's you know everything is taking it just takes a long time it's a lot of focus but yeah. i mean that that's what yeah. our job is that's what we do here every day exactly yeah and that's, that's what like, keeps uh, us keeps us moving somehow <laughs> yeah exactly and yep. it's great. That, I mean, I, I really like the idea that you do the products, you do the research, you also grow them. So it's like a, the whole whole system, whole thing. And I also know that you have a great team. I have met several of your team and all of you are just like lovely people as well. So I really like uh, like like um, what Gabba is doing like holistically. Uh, I want to jump back a little bit about the benefits of certain mushrooms. And because one of the big, big issues at the moment in this society are sleep problems and i've actually used reishi particularly your reishi in um i think now for like half a year or something almost every night and i i see some major major effects on that reishi so uh, can you tell a little bit about uh, mushrooms for for sleep support yeah um so i think reishi is probably the most popular and I, and I think that it's like, like, I love, we were talking about Simlan before and I love Simlan because he always tells people you gotta, what is it? You gotta drink water and get enough sleep. Everything else is optimizing that, that is the basics, you know? And I love, I love yeah. that because we, as biohackers or as like a health influencers or as health educators, you know, basically it's a lot, a lot about all these complex things. Like we just had a lot of complex talk, a lot of, a lot of scientific names, a lot of very complex concepts. Um, it's, it's a lot to follow, but, but at the basics, drink water, drink enough water, get enough sleep and you're going to be pretty okay. And then if you're, if you're ready to move to the next step. And so I think sleep is such a basic necessity. I mean, we have a mental health crisis on our hands, you know, in, in, in Finland, but also in the world right now for many reasons with the COVID and everything else that's happening. Um, and, you know, sleep like our ring has been talking about sleep scores in general have been going down. You know, I mean, they can see that they can, they can visually represent that data, you know, of, of, uh, of what's happening. And of course, I also wear this like, you know, outer ring so I can also be testing how my sleep is, is doing. Um, and, and that's an important metric for my life, right? It, it, I, I can actually tell I, I'm having a bad day. I'm not thinking very, very clearly. I'm going to be grumpier, right? Or I'm agitated more. And I look at, oh, wait, my sleep score is really bad. Okay, yes, of course, I didn't get very good sleep last night. Yeah, um, it's like insomnia is associated or just like even one night, one single night, sleep deprivation is associated with so many like noticeable outcomes, both in mood and in learning. Actually, um, Matthew Walker and their, their team has shown that even one night sleep restriction can decrease the learning potential for 40 percent it increases the amygdala hyperreactivity so you're emotionally more agitated all the time and we actually have this negativity bias after sleep restriction which is that we just pay attention to more negative and threatful stimuli which is like even single night that's that's so i, I feel that so true <laughs> you know? yeah i think we've um, all been there <laughs> So I think what, what's, I mean, reishi is not like a, a cure-all for everything, right? I mean, I, it's important to understand how the mechanism works. And to the best of our understanding, the mechanism in which reishi helps us sleep is that it's activating the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is a rest and digest part, right? So it's the, oh, let's chill out. Let's calm down. Let's woof. Let's bring it right down. And, and that's why it's also, it can be helpful during the day. You know, if, 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 if you have, if it's a Saturday morning, you wake up and uh, it's been a very stressful week of work and you are just still just going through all the stuff and thinking about stuff. And you can also then take reishi too. 
Also help yourself calm down, rest and digest, reduce that stress levels, you know. Um, but going to sleep, it's a no brainer. I think we all have like a high stress levels right now with the state of the world. And it's really helpful to just, if your mind is really active, it's, it's calming it down. <laughs> it's, letting, it's letting you slide into sleep when your body needs it really bad. So it's not giving like melatonin. It's not a chemical stimulus to activate like sleep. It's not doing that. Mm -hmm. It's just you allowing your body to use its natural cycles, but just letting it, it's just kind of forcing it to calm down. You know, meditation, this kind of thing could also help in those situations. But to me, Reishi is an invaluable, invaluable ally, you know, in my life for that. Mm. I did look into, like, there was a recent paper about actually review of the mechanisms on Reishi and sleep, because I was also like, they're like, I, I need to know why it, yeah. it feels good and why does it actually help help and they they had in identified or 80 active components uh, mainly these triterpenoids and sterols yeah. that affect multiple receptors in the central nervous system and the peripheral ner nervous system that can potentially uh, be responsible of this of this sleep uh, or like this hypnotic and sedative effects um yep. there were these be beta cytos I don't know how to pronounce that, beta cytosterol, that is yep. mainly linked to lowered cholesterol and this like fat loss. And, uh, but, but it also had sedative and anxiolytic uh, effects. And yep. it also actually had adenosine, which is like, we know that that controls the sleep-wake cycle as well. Um, so it's like uh, super interesting that they, uh, it does have uh, these compounds that affect those mechanisms, both centrally and peripherally that uh, controls the sleep wake circadian rhythm and then uh, the quality of the sleep within the within the slept sleeping hours basically so for example one interesting effect was i i read like i heard so much of this like oh reishi improves rem sleep yeah and i was like why 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 would it increase yeah. rem sleep per se uh, so they found that it's like um it activates their tnf alpha which is like actually pro inflammatory thing but it also increases the, the REM sleep. So like, uh, I, I guess in small doses, it can actually improve the sleep quality somehow. Uh, but uh, what is very interesting and very cool in these, these kind of sleep aids, I would say, I mean, I, I'm a fan of like sleep supplements as well. Um, so I also, also use like um, some, sometimes melatonin. I actually like using melatonin as well reishi then maybe sometimes some zinc or something that it would improve the the serotonin uh, pathways melatonin production are using and magnesium as well yeah magnesium for sure and then glycine as well for relaxation yeah. these kind of things uh but like current sleep drugs at the market that people like get prescribed on like benzos or some sort of yeah. you know, melatonin agonists or this orexin ag uh, antagonists or something like that they usually have just one active ingredient affecting one brain regulatory system, um, usually on like GABA or, or melatonin. And these medicinal mushrooms, this review article are also uh, talking about this, that it's good because they have so much different or so many different um, compounds yeah. and so many different mechanisms. They usually don't give any grogginess. Like I haven't noticed any grogginess in the morning. I, I wake up refreshed and, and good after ha having uh, used, for example, reishi and uh, like no, no addictive potential or anything like that, at, at least not that we know of at the moment. So um, seems like very safe alternative to some of the pharmacological drugs that may have negative side effects for some. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think like you mentioned, I mean, ganodermic acid, we've identified like 130 different ganodermic acids, you know, triterpenes. I mean, th these are really important compounds there for, for, for all these elements. And I think it's, it's for us, it was really important to identify what, are, what do our, what are our customers taking ratio for? What, what is the benefit that people are looking for there? And I, I think it's predominantly sleep. It's predominantly like this re relaxing effect. Um, and so how we grow reishi is actually to enhance that, right? So we grow reishi that maximizes the outside surface area of reishi, which is the home for most of the ganodermic acid and triterpene profiles. 
So that's just, I mean, that's where we're thinking is like, how, how can we lean into that? How, how can we, how can we lean into that side of things? So that's, that's maybe why you've had a lot of success with our, with our ratio that way, because we're, we're really, we're trying to grow it in a way that's, 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 you know, what, what people want <laughs> basically. Mm, yeah, exactly. And then uh, one of the interesting benefits was also in Reishi was the effects on cut microbiome. Mm. So it, it, it was linked to some like produ- production of specific um, gut flora and um, increase in this kind of bacteroids and firmicutes ratio and decrease of some of the harmful things like helicobacter. Um, so that also probably like, could be one of the effects that it much less sleep because we know the gut microbiome then the health of the mm. gut microbiome is uh, very essential to proper functioning of the vagus nerve and, um, and how how close to sleep mm. are you taking rishi maybe actually quite close to sleep i would say maybe 15 minutes half an hour before bed even yeah yeah that's about i think a half an hour to an hour is kind of where i found that sweet spot but yeah, it's mm. interesting i think i think it's interesting for our I don't know what you say. What is what is better, a good night's sleep or not having amyloid beta plaque buildup? I mean, you know what I mean. If you sort of think about both? kind of the benefits, <laughs> of these different, both are yeah, both are better. Um, <laughs> but I think it's interesting. Or, or like for instance, antioxidant regime, high antioxidant regime from chaga. I, I think that reishi is very interesting for people because you can track it, and that's I, I just so love the more and more that we have these wearables and we have this you know test that we can do because you can you can instantly go okay, this is working for me. This mm. I, I've looked at the literature, I've looked at the research, I've heard these people say these things, but I can actually test it on myself, and that is such a powerful thing. I think, you know, to, to make that to make that full circle just feel clear. Yes, yes, for sure, and it's also, yeah, important for us to know what actually works for us. As you know, you also talk about biohacking, and you have the um, like a biohacking information in your in your um, web page, and even a biohackers bundle for mushrooms. It's like the whole point of like uh, these optimized health uh, practices are that you you know what your body needs and you mm. do something to improve it and then you see if it actually worked mm. so because you can do so much so much yeah uh, for your health uh, there is all the time new research and everything so as you said like the ratio is interesting in the sense that you can actually see uh, improvements in sleep data um, yeah, for sure. And I, I feel it in the morning as well. Like, uh, it just feels good. Um, so how, how would you like, um, what is actually the way to use the medicinal mushrooms? Like we have chaga, we have reishi, we have maitake, shiitake, everything. Like how, if one wants to start using medicinal mushrooms for health support, what's the best way to approach it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so how to actually use, so actually our company will be launching with um, uh, Rohan Yuri. They're gonna have their 40th, uh, so that, that's a retail, a kind of health food retail store here in Finland. And we're gonna be launching kind of an exclusive product with them. So Kappa Health is gonna start making powder. Yay. So, we, so we've had a lot, of, a lot of customer feedback that um, they would also like us to make a powder product. So. So yeah, we've, we've been making powder product as an ingredient, um, but now we're going to have it on our own brand as well, which is really nice. So that will launch here soon. So in terms of how you take it, I mean, powder is pretty much pretty much soluble, like fully soluble. So you can mix it in, you know, morning coffee or evening tea, basically just totally dissolves or even in water, cold water is also fine. And uh, with the with the uh, liquid tinctures that we also sell, the Soma line, um, personally, I'm mainly blending those in my morning coffee you know, with some of that food and makes a really good coffee creamer um, that is like a not milk based, has some color. It's a collagen. Oh, the, the, the MCT collagen coffee creamer. Yes. Yeah, yes, I, I love the, that. And then I'm, the best. I'm adding more. Yes, it's so good. And then I'm adding more uh, MCT oil and some ghee uh, and then all my mushrooms, basically, and a little bit of creatine powder. Uh, I think it helps my brain, too. Um, mm. But yeah, I think, it. you know, that, that's kind of my morning morning coffee situation and i'm always taking lion's mane and chaga every morning basically mm-hmm. and, and that's why we put those in the biohacking kit because to me so lion's you know, mane high... for the brain benefits and chaga for yep. what do you take it for and mainly i'm taking it i mean 
everything is immunity, right? So it's kind of like, you know, if you're taking them, like lion's mane, yes, it's good for your brain. It also has very high levels of beta glucans. You're also getting all those, all those immunomodulatory effects as well. Um, and so for, I don't really, I, I consider every mushroom immunity supporting. So that, that's just that. Mm. I'm always thinking about what that secondary benefit is uh, or, or primary, depending how you think of it. So lion's mane, yes, for mainly the brain benefit. Uh, chaga, to me, it's, you know, a high antioxidant regime uh, is, is, is really important. You know, like Sinclair is always talking about this too. I think it's, you know, one, one mechanism in which our body ages from what I understand is that, you know, free radicals from stress, from alcohol, from frying, you know, low heat oil with high heat <laughs> that burns. Um, these free radicals are fall crazy, just smashing around in our body. And as they hit RNA or DNA, and that cell needs to sort of like re rebirth, um, you know, it's having some problems doing that. So we get, you know, not so great skin, not so great hair as we age, but also eyes, mouth, liver, kidneys, heart, lungs, what, everything. So I think a high antioxidant regime to help neutralize those free radicals is a really important anti-aging, uh, you know, regime. And I think chaga is just, it's just the best. It just has the highest amount of antioxidants and a very, very, very large range of different antioxidant compounds in it. So I, I consider that just uh, crucial to my morning morning experience and my life, you know, I don't need to live till I'm 200, but I, I you know, if I live till I'm a hundred and, or even 90 and I'm just having a great time at the end, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm really excited about that. So. Yeah. And many times we emphasize that, uh, you know, that it's not about trying to live as long as possible, but trying to live as healthy as possible. Yeah. Right? So the, to increase the, the health span. So the, how does like just that just an energy and uh, the immunity for sure mm. um, for the rest of the life. Like that's the, that's the goal. So Chaga lines me in every morning and then I'm taking um, uh, Reishi some nights when I'm going to sleep. I'm not taking mm. it every night. Uh, I, I actually sleep really well um, for whatever reason, but uh, I'm taking it some nights and then that's, that's pretty much it, you know, for, mm. for my mushroom uh, intake. Uh, I know that I, I am taking shiitake, like if my kids are, are sick, which like they're both in school, paivakoti, daycare, this kind of thing. So if they come home and they're kind of sick, I'm taking a shiitake as well. Um, because I think shiitake is helping with the immune system, not only with beta glucans, but it also has a compound called L-ergothyrene, which actually was, um, um, it was, it was the, the process in which that was taken out was patented by a company in California. Uh, and they're, they're doing COVID clinical trials with that because Basically, what L-ergothyrene does is it's a cytoprotectant. So when we go back to thinking about the, you know, mushrooms are more closely related to humans than they are to, uh, we are to plants. Um, mushrooms and humans develop two different paths of our immune system. So humans have developed a much stronger um, cell-based immune system. So it's very difficult for viruses to come in, hijack it, and then replicate themselves and cause all the chaos, right? It's, it's much more difficult than in mushrooms, but mushrooms have a chemical based immune system. So they're, they're having a lot of chemicals that are helping support their immune system from, from viruses and stuff that are attacking them. And should, so we have receptors and we can use those, those compounds. So L-ergothyrene from shiitake is actually strengthens our cell walls. So if you first sign of, of basically there could be some sickness happening, uh, you start to feel that little bit like, uh, dragging or mm, uh, you know you're, you're pain, brain fog your body's achy you're just starting to feel that like okay my immune i'm getting attacked right now this is going down um my body's telling me i need to rest a little bit more everything else uh, i take shiitake a couple times a day like three four times a day a couple a couple of what maybe two milliliters three four times a day and and then i just yep doesn't happen i also take vitamin c i also take zinc i mean it's not part of it's a part of a protocol for me but it's um it's a very important part of that protocol and for me, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm like the, the secondary benefits of like a turkey tail, maitake, um, you know, just not a huge part of what I, what I need right now in my life. Mm. So basically know what you want, know what you want to improve and then find a, find a mushroom for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good, awesome. Well, this has been super in informative and I've learned so much new things about medicinal fungi and will be... Uh, very interested in seeing what Kappa Health does in the future, all the research, all the develop, development or, of new products and everything. It's definitely going to be something to look, um, look in the future and pay attention to these uh, fungi and especially your company as well. And I would like, like to end this, uh, this uh, interview by asking you, like, 
in in addition to medicinal fungi what is your like number one health tip or health tool or or health practice that you would emphasize for me in my life so i'm so that's a good question um what i do i mean you know i have uh the company's growing quite fast there's a i'm you know things things are th yeah company's growing quite fast uh and and some days i have a lot of stress right from that So what I'm doing is I'm going home and I'm, I have uh, three kids at home. So I've got a seven-year-old, a six-year-old and a uh, like 15, 16-month-year-old. Uh, and I'm, I'm just playing with them. I, I, I just go home and I, and I put my phone away. Uh, I'm not checking any WhatsApp messages. I'm not looking at any Instagram things. I'm not, I really try to just separate that and, and give this space just for family, just for connecting with the kids, just for making good foods, You know, we light some candles every night. We turn off some really high bright lights. We just make a really cozy environment. And uh, we make, we have also wood heating at the house. So I, 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 I make some wood fires and, you know, just sometimes we make popcorn or whatever, but I'm just, I'm really wrestling with the kids. I'm flowing with them. I'm, you know, we're, we're playing all these games and I'm chasing them around the house and I'm, I'm throwing my 16 month year old daughter in the air and I'm, she's squealing and I'm laughing. And, and I mean, it, it's just 10 minutes of that and I'm, forget about everything and it's and it's just such a it's such a nice uh, a nice way to kind of help transition and then and then when i'm at the work in the next morning i'm i'm waking up and i want to be here right i wake up and i want to i'm excited to to face the challenges of the day i'm excited to 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 take new things on um but i think it's really important that we have that transition and and for that reason i guess i don't work at home i work in the office i want to keep those places sacred and separate i want to have uh here i want to be really focused and and you know, focused on work and getting things done. And at home, I want to do the opposite. So I think it's just, um, yeah, for me, it's that, that's it. That's it. Just, just enjoy, enjoy life and, and don't get too caught up in to-do lists. And, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's my health, health tip. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear what questions and ideas you got from today's episode, so leave a comment on YouTube and let me know about you. If you liked this episode, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcast. This also helps with podcast ranking and visibility. If you know someone who might benefit from listening to today's episode, consider sharing it with them and spreading health. Looking forward to having you around next time as well. Subscribe to get notified on the next episode. See you next time at the same place. Have a great rest of the week.